I'm sure each and every single one of us have a movie that we watched at two different stages of our life, where we had two completely polar opposite reactions to it. The first time I saw Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, I was 9 years old. Funny story, the way my family came into possession of the DVD for that film was a bonus offer from Pizza Hut, a free movie with any pizza combo, which was very generous considering the quality of this movie and its time of release when they decided to offer it as a freebie. Before watching the movie, my brother who had watched it in theatres with his friends told me it was an extremely boring and uneventful movie that wasn't worth my time. As a huge fan of Russell Crowe from my youth and into present day, I was expecting a movie the likes of Gladiator 2.0, a fast-paced, guns ablazing adrenaline fueled naval warfare movie. And after going back and watching the marketing for this film 16 years ago, I get the impression that's what the rest of the world was expecting as well. And it's for this reason, one of several others, that I believe this film didn't receive nearly enough praise upon its release. When I first saw Master and Commander The Far Side of the World, I was honestly so bored, but also so unaccustomed to staying up late and watching movies in my youth. So much so in fact that I fell asleep halfway through. My thoughts on the movie reflected that of my brothers, who tempered my expectations before watching it, and ultimately I found the film disappointing. However, when I rewatched the movie for the first time in over 10 years, I was left in a mix of emotions. On one hand, I was in absolute awe of the film's magnificence, and on the other hand, I was absolutely encapsulated with self-loathing for leaving the movie on my shelf for as long as I did. Master and Commander The Far Side of the World is what I believe to be the most underrated blockbuster epic of all time. That was, without a doubt, given the short end of the straw when it was first released to audiences around the world. As I previously mentioned, the movie was mismarketed in its trailers, and the audience had its expectations tempered for a different style of film. One that was more fast-paced and bombastic with action set pieces. And even though these elements are present in the movie, there's really only two major action set pieces throughout the film. In actuality, the film is more so about brotherhood, the bonds of friendship, and choosing between one's friendship and one's duty. There's also the underlying themes of being an outsider from the majority of your peers and being the victim of peer pressure and bullying. The courage to follow orders you disagree with, even when they mean certain death for yourself or for someone else. And the burden of living with these actions undertaken. There's also the theme of drawing the line between leadership and tyranny. The line between duty and one's own personal desire and ambition. But above all else, I'd like to think the major theme of the movie is the hardship and dependent on other people during times of war. With this story taking place at the height of Napoleon's reign, it's rare to come across a movie that juggles so many themes and betrays them to the audience with such finesse and mastery, so as not to pull them out of the experience but instead further draw them in. In addition to being falsely marketed, this film also had the absolute worst time of release one could imagine, being overshadowed by two major players of 2003. So let's start with the winner of 11 bloody Academy Awards, back when the Academy still had a shred of credibility. Yes, Lord of the Rings Return of the King released the same year, and let's be honest, nothing was going to beat out the climax to the most hyped and anticipated trilogy of films since the original Star Wars trilogy back in the 70s and 80s. Just about every other film that year was doomed. Matter of fact, except for two Academy Awards, this film beat out Master and Commander for every other category it was nominated for. However, despite being released against that goliath of a film, that wasn't all. You're probably thinking, well, Master and Commander still had its own audience, those looking for a colonial naval adventure film across the seas. That's a very specific niche, and there's no way Master and Commander could be overshadowed by another film of a similar kind that year. Except... Yes, Master and Commander was released only a few short months after the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. I suspect a good chunk of the general audience members were possibly not too enticed by another colonial naval adventure film. Quite possibly, Master and Commander released in a stretch of time where the colonial era film genre had already been burnt out. And thus the film mismarketed and overshadowed fell into the ether of movies who never truly had their moment to shine in the sun. And here we are, 16 years later. Exactly. And we are going to give it the homage it deserves. Master and Commander The Far Side of the World is directed by Peter Weir, an excellent and very underrated director and unappreciated director. 
Hailing from the Promised Land. Yes, this OG hails from Sydney, like me. He has directed many films over the years, but the most notable gems, at least in terms of his films that I've heard of, are Dead Poets Society, The Truman Show, and Gallipoli. However, when it came to production of Master and Commander, he took the reins of both writer and producer as well. And what a marvelous job he did, as this movie has some of the most well-written and charming dialogue I've heard in any given movie. Master and Commander is based off a very old book set of novels known as the Aubrey Maturin series by Patrick O'Brien. I have not read the books myself, so I can't speak for how faithfully the work was adapted. However, I'm just outlining for all of you the baseline for how this film came together to be what it is today. The premise of Master and Commander is the HMS Surprise, helmed by Captain Lucky Jack Aubrey, is out voyaging the seven seas and is tasked with finding and destroying or capturing the HMS Acheron, a French man of war vessel, with much stronger hull integrity and over twice their cannons and twice their ship crew, a near suicidal task on paper. However, an important detail is Captain Jack has also been ordered not to pursue this target beyond Brazil. I shall say no more on that, otherwise we'd be entering spoiler territory. The movie leaves an impact quite early on to demonstrate to the audience just how grim of a predicament the crew of the HMS Surprise face, and how dangerous and intelligent their adversary is. What I like about this movie is the battle of wits between Captain Jack and his cunning adversary, the opposing captain of the Acheron. And while you never get to see what's happening on the opposing ship, the film makes an effort to remind you that the culture and order you're witnessing on the HMS Surprise is also happening on the Acheron, the film's antagonist. This movie is a clear example to show that not every movie needs a clear-cut and well-fleshed-out villain to leave an impact on the audience. The most you get from the antagonist's perspective is a few lingering POV shots directed at the ship you come to know and love. The film's plot quickly turns into a game of cat and mouse, with the punishing fury of the sea becoming a character of its own. The ship's crew begin as strangers to the audience, but by the end of the film, the audience grows attached to many of them without even knowing or remembering their names, but by witnessing their actions. That's speaking for the majority, of course. The main characters of the story are undoubtedly the dozen or so members of the captain's cabin. Undoubtedly, the best part of this movie is the chemistry between actors Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany. It's not their first collaboration, they've worked together on other projects before, but their conversations are just so intellectually stimulating. You'll find yourself just drawn to the screen whenever they share a scene together. These two characters play off each other very, very well. Captain Jack, a hardened sailor, a veteran of naval warfare, commander of over 100 men aboard his vessel, a man of honor sworn to uphold his duty, and a slave to his own prideful ambition. The ship's doctor, who just so happens to be Jack's best friend, Stephen, is more of a humanitarian, having to tend to the ship's casualties, looking upon their hardships at sea through their eyes, rather than through Jack's eyes, and watching his friend slowly change into something dangerous to both his crew and himself, and trying to act as Jack's moral compass. The way these two argue with one another and challenge each other is extremely compelling, and the dialogue is pretty much flawless. When I went to watch the behind the scenes documentary for the making of this movie, I was so surprised how much of what was used was actually practical. I mean, this movie always felt gritty and real to me in its presentation and its set pieces, but when you see how they pretty much built everything from scratch, including the ship itself, it's nothing short of incredible. The only green screens I saw were off in the distance in order to simulate weather in the backgrounds. And yeah, admittedly some shots are entirely computer generated, but but use the same physical models and digitally implement them in order to make the shots work. Point is, this feels like a very old style movie, one that you'll rarely see in 2019, and certainly a film I'd wager you'd have trouble finding being produced this way and at this scale within the past 5-10 to 10 years. This production was masterfully helmed and directed by Peter Weir. I've honestly yet to watch this movie and find anything massive that breaks my immersion. Admittedly, it is a very simple story, but even the simplest stories can be complex with the right dynamic between the characters. And as I said, these characters complement each other fantastically. Now the last thing I'd like to talk about is how real this movie feels from a violent standpoint. I'd find it hard to believe this film would be given a PG-13 rating in 2019, but despite the rating for mature audiences and not rated solely for adults, the violence feels extremely physical and real. You don't see the gore that a slasher film likes to display front and center, but there were one or two instances as a youth where I found myself looking away from the screen because it was hard for me to fathom 
something so painful being done to a human being. Now when I watch this movie as an adult I can easily stomach the violence but it never truly lost its weight. And that's because of each and every actor doing a damn good job selling their agony and distress. And well, that's pretty much all I have to say about Master and Commander. Trust me, I could go on singing this movie's praises, but it's best that you go and simply enjoy it for yourself, because it really is that good. I hope I haven't overhyped this movie, admittedly it is a personal favourite of mine. It's the kind of movie that you can enjoy with just about anybody. I'd recommend watching it with your family or a loved one, but it's perfectly watchable on one's lonesome, and admittedly, I prefer to watch this film alone so there's absolutely nothing to disrupt my immersion. Also, on a side note, one thing that I found unique to this film is that there is absolutely no romance subplot whatsoever. Even though romance can be executed well, it can also be overindulgent and distracting from what's happening on screen. So I often found myself watching this movie in the past if I was sulking over a girl, or if I was feeling depressed, or if I was just having an absolutely terrible day, just so I could be transported away from my problems for over two hours on a trip back in time without any reminders or distractions in the film regarding my current reality. And one more thing, there's absolutely no political commentary whatsoever regarding the politics of the early 2000s or the mid to late 2010s, which I'm sure at this point in time, many of you will find extremely refreshing. This is a movie you have likely overlooked or only scarcely heard about, and anyone who has seen it will tell you exactly what I'm telling you now. Go watch Master and Commander The Far Side of the World. Go watch this masterpiece.